the 10th chapter. I think this is going to prove to be a very interesting and inspirational message. I hope it is. I know it touched me when the Lord was giving it to me. Luke chapter 10, beginning at verse 25, we're going to read about 12 verses all told. And if you would stand today in honor of the reading of God's Word, listen to what the Lord has to say. Luke chapter 10, beginning at verse 25, and I read today from the New King James Version, And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, what is written in the law? What is your reading of it? Now, I, I just got to stop there for half a second. Look at what Jesus said. This is very interesting. He said, what is written in the law? What is your reading of it? In other words, what is your understanding of what you've read? So he answered and said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he, meaning Jesus, said to him, You have answered rightly. Do this, and you will live. But he, wanting to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Then Jesus answered and said, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a certain priest came down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite, when he arrived at the place, came and looked and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him, and went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, and he set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. On the next day, when he departed, he took out two venerites, gave them to the innkeeper and said to him, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I come again, I will repay you. So which of these three do you think was neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? And the man said, He who showed mercy on him. Then Jesus said to him, Go and do likewise. Amen. I want to talk to us today on the topic of, I know where he's coming from. I know where he's coming from. I think you'll find it a little bit different than what you might be expecting. Would you bow with me in prayer? Master, we love you. We thank you again, God, for this opportunity to be in the house of God. We just ask God right now that you would open your anointing. Allow it to be poured out in this place, God, that every individual here will be able to leave this place feeling better and knowing you more than they've ever known before. God, we just ask right now in the name of Jesus that your anointing would rest upon your messenger as well as the ears of those that would hear. For God, I cannot do it alone today. I ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I want to quickly do something for you in the way of a, a little bit of a visual aid that I created. I like to do this once in a while when I preach, if I have time. It's going to want to stick to me. There we go. We're talking about the story today that is commonly referred to as The Good Samaritan. How do you like that? So now as I preach, you've got something to look at that will help you 
to kind of focus a little bit on what we're talking about. We're talking about the story of the Good Samaritan. You see, people often react to humanity in distress based upon preconceived notions as to where that person is coming from or where it is that they have been. Have you ever seen somebody that maybe they had a car accident and as you're driving by you look at them and say, well I know where he's coming from, he's probably coming from that bar down the street, had too much to drink and now he's had an accident. Fool, he brought it upon himself. Amen, haven't you now? I think we've all kind of come to judgment. When you see somebody, a lot of us have seen somebody in distress or in a bad situation and we think we know where they're coming from because after all if that's not where they were coming from they wouldn't be where they are now would they what about that young black man in prison and everybody said well he's from the wrong side of the tracks he's from the bad side of town he's in jail because he, he got caught up with the wrong kids and the wrong people and got to doing the wrong thing when in reality maybe he's a perfectly good kid and a nice kid but he happened to get stopped by a police officer who wasn't so good and so nice. Who didn't have such good intentions. Who didn't think very well of his rights as an American citizen and decided to treat him rather poorly and treat him rather badly. And before it's all said and done, the young man finds himself in prison. But when you see him there, you think you know where he's coming from. Do you hear what I'm telling you today? See, it's easy for us to do that, isn't it? Well, I've got news for you. Within the religious mindset and with, within the religious community, there's a lot of thinking that goes on like this. Each of the three men that were passing by, this wounded and robbed man on this day, each one of them may very well have said or at least thought the same identical thing. Oh, I know where he's coming from. You see, you see that individual in a destitute situation and somehow we assume that they have put themselves in harm's way by acting improperly or making the wrong decisions. How many times have we passed by another in distress because we think we know where they are coming from? Did they not even prejudge the Lord Jesus Christ himself based upon where he was from? Amen. The Bible said in John chapter 1 verses 43 through 46, the following day Jesus wanted to go to Galilee and he found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said to him, Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Amen. Do you see how easy it is to judge somebody based on our perception of where they're coming from? Isn't it interesting that in the little portion of scripture I just read to you, that the writer not only told us where Jesus was wanting to go, but also where Philip was from. That Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew, and Philip. And, uh, and Peter, I'm sorry. Why is it so important to know where everybody's from? Well, I don't know. You meet somebody new, especially if you're in high society, and what's the first question they ask you? Where are you from? Amen, right? Where are you from? Who are your folks? Where are you from? That determines what kind of human being you are, they think. Because after all, if you come from a better place, you're bound to be a better person. Tell that to the Menendez brothers. Amen. 
They grew up in the lap of luxury. Their dad was a multi-millionaire. They had everything they ever wanted. But they turned around and got tired of mom and dad and decided to bless them to death. So you see, growing up on the right side of the tracks doesn't always mean you're going to be the right kind of person. Amen? And growing up on the wrong side of the tracks doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be the wrong kind of person either. Am I telling the truth? Amen. So when we see someone in a certain place in life, we cannot always assume that they have brought it upon themselves somehow or by reason of where they come from. Sometimes someone will actually tell us where they are coming from because they have come to believe that they're unlovable and beyond hope or help. You ever met somebody that just thought so little of themselves that they begin to tell you their sob story? And in a way, it was an effort to push you away. Because they figure the more you know about me, the less you want to be with me, the less you want to know me, the less you want to spend time. You ever met anybody like that? I have. It's a terrible thing when somebody is so beat down and feels so poorly about themselves that they feel like the more they share with you about who they are and where they've come from, the less you're going to want to be around them. I remember a little woman in the Bible, and it's interesting because just like the Good Samaritan, she also was a Samaritan. In John chapter 4, we read the story of a little lady who came to Jesus at the well. But she didn't think very highly of herself. She didn't feel very good about herself. Because when Jesus began to talk to her, immediately she began to go down a litany of things that would push him away. She figured, the more you know about me, the less, the less you'll like me. In verses 4 through 9, and he must needs go through Samaria. Then cometh he, Jesus, to the city of to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away unto the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, Listen to this. How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. My Lord, what she do? She said, Look where I'm coming from. I come from Samaria. How can you? How can you even want to talk to me? I'm, I'm a Samaritan. Don't you realize I'm coming? I'm, I'm a Samaritan. Look where I'm coming from. But see, Jesus wasn't prejudging her on the basis of where she was coming from. The Lord knew in His Spirit where she was going. Amen. As their conversation continued, she found something else. She thought might cause this man to lose interest in conversation with her. In verse 15 and 16 uh, through verse 18, the woman said unto him, Sir, give me this water that he was talking about, and that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. Jesus saith unto her, Go call thy husband and come hither. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband, for thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou now hast is not thy husband, in that saidst thou truly. Sir, let me tell you where I come from. Let me tell you where I've been. I, I don't, I, I'm not married right now. <laughs> And we think we're turning the Lord off, and you know what the Lord says? He said, well, let me tell you how much of where you're coming from I know. You see, there are a lot of people in our community today that don't yet understand that God knows where they're coming from. Come on now. They are convinced that God has no interest in them. They're like the sinner woman at the well. 
the more I tell them, the less they'll want me. And what they don't understand is Jesus will turn around and say, let me tell you a little more about yourself. Because I know more where you're coming from than you know about yourself. I've been watching you from the day you were born. You may be humiliated. You may be embarrassed to have to admit to being divorced and remarried. But let me tell you how many husbands you've had. I know I was there. I was watching. You may feel like I can't go to God and tell him I'm gay or I'm lesbian. I can't tell God these things. Why can't you? Don't you think he knows? Amen. He knows where you're coming from. He knows what brought you to the place where you're at today. Hallelujah. And the only thing that's left you in miserable shape today is not who you are, but where you are. Amen. And the Good Samaritan wants to help you out of that bad place. Amen. The Lord did not include the fact that this man had begun his journey. This man we're talking about, the Good Samaritan, uh, and, and the man who fell among thieves. He did not include the fact that this man had begun his journey in Jerusalem and was bound for Jericho without a reason. Isn't it interesting that in a parable, where he's just trying to get a little point across, you might say, because that's what a parable does, it helps to make a point, right? Isn't it interesting that in this little parable, in the beginning of it, Jesus said he started out in Jerusalem and was headed for Jericho. Why did he do that? There's a reason. He wanted you to know where this man was coming from. Amen. Because when, as the story progresses, you need to know where this man was really coming from to understand this, this priest and this Levite who can walk by on the other side of the street and act like they don't even see him. When this man was from their own hometown. Amen. He was from the center of their own religion. Jerusalem. While he was probably a man that had been in the temple with them on several occasions. He's probably somebody they shook hands with at some point. But when they saw him in this destitute state, all of a sudden they were rest to jump to judgment and decide, well, I know where he's coming from. No, you don't. He's from your hometown. He's from the same place you are. How many people today look at our community and people in our community out there who are in terrible places. I mean, drinking themselves drunk, doing all kinds of drugs, sleeping with everything, got two legs. Well, I know where they're coming from. I know why they're doing all that. That's just what it is to be homosexual. That's just what it is to be that kind of person. I know what that's all about. You don't know anything, mister. They're from the same place you are. There was a time when they were in the house of God. There was a time when they were serving in the aisles of God's church. There was a time when they were speaking in church under the anointing of the Holy Ghost. My friend, they're from the same place you are. And isn't it just pitiful that the only one who could see that and recognize that was the Samaritan man who was an outcast, stuck between two places, but the Jews don't want him, the Gentiles don't want him. But when he looked at that rock man, he saw the same thing, and he thought the same thing as that priest and as that Levite did, but the difference is when he fought it, and when he said it, he fought it and said it with compulsion and not contempt. I know where he's coming from. Boy, do you see the difference? See the difference between the contemptuous attitude? Oh, I know where he's coming from. And the compassionate attitude? I know where he's coming from. Amen. Do you hear me today? Folks, we're in this place today, and God's given us a unique position, a unique opportunity. We're in a unique opportunity today 
to look out on our community that is hurting. There are so many people out there that are so miserable today that can't see straight. I talk to people all the time, and you know what? It's not a gay thing. Because I talk to straight folks that equally is miserable. It don't have nothing to do with whether you're straight or gay. And people in our community who convince themselves, well, this is about being gay. If I wasn't gay, I'd be happy. I've got news for you, fool. If you wasn't gay, you'd be straight and miserable. It's the truth. How about those of us who have tried the changing routine so we could be happy? How happy were we? I know I wasn't very thrilled. Amen. Then there, done that, bought the t-shirt, hated every minute of it. It was no Disneyland. Amen. Do you understand what I'm telling you today? I'm trying to tell you, God has placed us. There's a reason this church exists. You know why? Because now there are compassionate eyes that can look upon those in our community and say, I know where he's coming from. Hallelujah. And we can minister and we can help and we can bring healing and we can bring restoration. Glory to God. Those people are from the same place we are. They come from the same background we come from. We now are in a position to be able to minister to them in a positive and wonderful way. Why does this pastor get so aggravated Sunday after Sunday when people don't come to church and when they're not here and when they don't do what they know to do? I'll tell you why. Because I'm still looking at those hurting and broken people out there and knowing how much we could do if we get in here and do what's right. Then we'd have a place. Then we'd have a hospital for the broken where we could bring people and see them restored. Then we'd have a church where people could be brought in and walk down to the altar and pray through to the Holy Ghost once again. Then we'd have a church where that old spirit of addiction, of alcohol and drugs could be cast out of people and they could be free and they could be delivered by the power of God through the glory of Jesus' name. If we'd get some folk that would get up in this place and start caring about those that are out there. You know why I'm here today? Because I'm going to get a big paycheck for this. Sweetheart, I paid for the rent for this church for this month. It come out of my money, okay? I'm not getting any paycheck for this. I'm here because I believe in what I'm doing. And I love the Lord to save me. And I know that He can help anybody that wants to be helped. Amen. And, and I want to see a place where God's people who are broken and tormented and tortured like that man right there that you're looking at in that picture where we could bring him and see him restored to perfect health spiritually, mentally, psychologically because I've got news for you if half these folks in our community would get their spiritual act together psychologically and emotionally they'd be restored Amen, you go to Hope Counseling Center down there at Cathedral of Hope today, and you talk to them and ask them what the biggest psychological troubling that people come into them with, ask them, what, what's the biggest issue that troubles people psychologically than, that they wind up in your counseling center? It's about their Christianity and their sexuality. It's about who they are. It's about reconciling. So you see, if they could be in here today and reconcile with God, they could find peace and rest for their spirit. They could find peace and rest for their emotional man. They could find peace and rest for their psychological demand. Do you hear what I'm telling you? Amen. My Lord, have mercy. I know this is an unusual message, but I hope you're getting it. How many churches and organizations today have practices which involve putting the unclean thing away as far as possible? Isn't it interesting that the Levite and the priest, as they walked by, had to get as far removed from that man as they could? How many churches 
I was thinking about this last night. I said, you know what, if I really wanted to stir up some fat in the fire, I could really cause some trouble when I go up home. I could go down there to Bridgeport, Connecticut and visit Brother Brock's church. With his little old porky wife who likes to write me all her nasty letters. See, so y'all don't have to deal with the stuff I have to deal with and then wonder why the preacher gets discouraged that people don't support him and don't stand behind him. You try getting a dozen emails a week that tells you you're a demon and you're a devil for preaching this message to gay lesbian people and see how you feel after a while. See if it doesn't bring you down a little bit. It gets very discouraging because you know what? There are far fewer people in our communities writing me letters telling me what an angel I am and what a God said I am than there are those telling me what a devil I am. But you let me go over there to Apostolic Church of Bridgeport and go into that church and I'll bet you a dime to a donut that little old sister Brock would be right up with her little bun on her head and her little dress and long sleeve and she'd ask me to leave. I bet you. Because after all, it is the practice of many like the priests and like the Levite in the story to get away from the unclean thing, or at least that which you perceive as unclean. Because see, they weren't looking at that man as one who was coming from Jerusalem, just like them. They were looking at him like he was coming from some bad place. Had to be. Because if you're not coming from a bad place, you would be in a bad place. That's the logic. <laughs> In Acts chapter 10, we read the story of Peter's experience on the rooftop. The Bible said, On the morrow, as they went on their journey and drew nigh unto the city, Peter went up upon the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. And he became very hungry and would have eaten. But while they made ready, he fell into a trance and saw heaven opened and a certain vessel descending unto him as if it had been a great sheet knit at the four corners and let down to the earth, wherein were all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth and wild beasts and creeping things and fowls of the air. And there came to him a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. See, Lord, uh-uh, no, common and things that are unclean, I, I put them away from me. I, I, don't, I don't partake of them. I don't consume them. I put them away. That's what we're supposed to do, isn't it? The Lord's response to him was, and the voice spake unto him again the second time, What God hath cleansed, that call not thou common. Oh, my Lord, have mercy. I got news for you. There'll be a lot of people in the judgment going to hear a great big resounding rebuke because they wanted to put this little old affirming church over here off to the side as unclean. And God's going to say, that which I have called clean, don't you dare call it common. Come on now. I put my seal of approval on those people. I put my spirit in their midst. They knew that I was there with them. How dare you call them unclean or uncommon? Hallelujah. How dare you tell me what is right and what isn't right? I'm God, not you. This vision was not given to Peter as a means of liberating him in matters of diet, but rather in liberating him in matters of with whom Peter could associate and fellowship. It had been given to Peter just prior to the men from Cornelius' house coming to him and inviting him because Cornelius was a Gentile. To Peter he was unclean. But God was preparing him. Peter, you go where I tell you to go. Just because you think you know where they come from, come on now. That doesn't mean you know anything. If I tell you to go, you go. That which I call clean, don't you dare call common. This principle is set 
in such a manner so as not to even exclude, or excuse me, include the Lord Jesus Christ as a figure in it at all. The parable that we're talking about. Jesus isn't even a figure in this parable. Amen. Every time you hear it preached, everybody talks about Jesus is the good Samaritan. No, he's not. Amen. The Lord didn't tell it. He did not tell this story to include him in this story whatsoever. The point of this entire parable was to help an individual understand who was his neighbor. So who is the subject in the story? The man whom Jesus was telling the story to. Did you hear me? Guess what that means for us today? Amen. That means you're that figure right there with the beard. Who is your neighbor is the point of this parable. The Lord's trying to teach us a lesson. Who is your neighbor? You are the editorial you. You are the subject of this story. Amen. And you have the option of either falling into the character of the Levite, the priest, or the Samaritan. Well, brother, now who in the world would want to be a Samaritan? He's a castaway. He, he's not wanted by anybody. He's a half-breed. Who wants to be the Samaritan? He's the one that has the most difficult life of anybody in that entire story. But he's the one who knew enough to show compassion. Amen. That's why I want to be him, because he knew enough to show compassion. He knew enough how to be godly, whereas the priest and the Levite only knew how to look and sound and act godly. Amen. A lot of churches out there today, sister, that are real good at knowing how to look godly. But when it comes right down to being godly, they haven't got a clue. The Lord was given this parable as a means, he was giving this parable as a means of illustrating to this one lawyer that he was speaking to just exactly who we ought to identify as our neighbor so that we might know who it is that we are to love as ourselves. We are supposed to be the good Samaritan in this story, not the man who was robbed, not the priest and not the Levite who passed him by. Mark chapter 12, verses 28 through 34, And one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together and perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, Which is the first commandment of all? And Jesus answered and said to him, the first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. That's why we're a oneness church. What I say, the foundation principle of the Christian faith, Deuteronomy 6 and 4, Jesus just quoted it. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. The Lord said, This is the greatest commandment. To understand one God. But he continues and says, and Jesus answered in the first commandment of all, commandment to hear with Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is like, namely this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. And isn't it interesting that religion after religion, church after church, are preaching commandment after commandment from their pulpit. And somehow or another, these two just seem to get bypassed. Amen. Somehow or another, these two. The Lord said they're none greater than these two. These are the two greatest and yet these are the two that are least preached 
in no circle. My Lord, have mercy. Certain phrases may be spoken with contempt or they may be uttered with compassion. I know where he's coming from is just such a phrase. When we can honestly look at an individual and say the same thing as the religious hypocrites, but say it with a heart of compassion and not with a tone of contempt, then we know that we have passed from death unto life through Jesus Christ. Amen. We can say the same thing, but we're saying it differently. We're saying it with compassion, not with contempt. Luke 22, 31 and 32. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you, that thy faith fail not, and when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. I'm going to tell you, God didn't put you in church this afternoon for no reason. Come on now. He didn't put you here so you can just sit here and look good. He put you here today so that you can be in a place to be that good Samaritan. So that you can look on those who are coming from the same place that you once were. So you can look at those who are where you once have been. And you can have compassion on them and reach out to them and bring healing to them. Glory to God. That's why we're here today. Wouldn't be enough if God just gave us this place so we could be comforted, so that we can be comfortable, so we can be happy. Said, Simon, I've got news for you. The devil's desire to sit you as wheat. Said, but when you convert it, in other words, he already knew Peter was going to fail. He said, I already know you're going to fail because when you convert it, when you come back, Strengthen the brethren. What does that mean? It means, sweetie, once you've been there, you're in a position to help those that are still there. Amen. Am I telling the truth? Amen. Now listen, we're almost done today. Galatians 6, 1 through 3. The Apostle Paul writes, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Isn't that what this fellow right here was doing? Helping to bear another man's burdens, he took financial responsibility for that man. The man had been robbed. He didn't have any money. He put him in a hotel and said, I'll pay you what I got now, and the next time I come through, I'll give you anything else that I owe you. He didn't say, get the rest from this fella. He said, when I come back, I'll pay you what I've got and what is owed. Because that's what the law of Christ is all about. Love your neighbor as yourself. It's bearing one another's burden. You know what? It's so much easier if two get up under it than just one. Amen. There's there never been anything I've carried in my life that didn't feel lighter when somebody else got on the other side of it. Amen. That's what God's people ought to be doing. Reaching out to folks and saying, here, let me help you carry that. But now listen to what else the Lord said, uh, what Paul said. For if a man think himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. See that old scribe, that old Pharisee, that old lawyer that passed by that man that day, they thought themselves to be a little something. But in reality, they weren't nothing except deceived. Obviously, these sanctified Pharisees, as it were, were convinced that they were something more than they were. The minute that any one of us looks in the mirror and sees anything but a sinner saved by grace, we are living in deception and in peril of losing our souls. Satan is the great deceiver, and he wants religious folks to get so caught up in the law 
and in rules and in religion that they begin to elevate themselves by putting others down. Everybody thinks that when hell busts wide open to accommodate the masses that will be going in, that it's going to be a bunch of unchurched folks. I got news for you, honey. It's going to be a bunch of churched folks. Because the, the deceiver of the brethren has convinced people that they're something more than they are. And he's convinced them to look upon others with contempt rather than with compassion. And he's looked upon them to, uh, he's caused them to act in a manner that is not motivated by compassion. We can either join the ranks today of the enlightened and reach out in love to our fallen and lost neighbors, or we can continue in the path of the deceived, believing that we can make heaven, having no concern for the fallen man by the side of the road. Did you hear me today? If you think you can walk past that man on the side of the road without any compassion in your heart to help him, then you are simply deceived. Amen. You're simply deceived. That's not how Christ works. That's not how the gospel of Jesus Christ works. That's not how Christians operate. It's not how the church of Jesus Christ operates. I've got a little something I want to give everybody today. You can take that home, put it on your refrigerator. That will remind you of this message. And Lord willing, it will also encourage each and every one of us to pray, God make us a good Samaritan. I may be an outcast. Come on now. I may be an outcast. Nobody may want me. I may be stuck in between two worlds. This, this world don't want me and that world don't want me. But Lord, I can still do right. I can still be godly. Hallelujah. I can still act right. Because godliness is not defined by my sexual orientation. Godliness is not nullified by my sexual orientation. Godliness can manifest itself in my life as a personal, individual human being. For who I am, I can be a godly gay lesbian person or I can be a fool. Or I can be a godly heterosexual person or I can be a fool. Because I'll just remind you lastly today, honey, I'm going to tell you, if you think there's anything goes on in gay lesbian clubs that isn't going on in straight clubs, I'll tell you right now, first-hand experience, you're wrong. You're wrong. The same foolishness, the same garbage, the same sexual exploits, the same drunkenness, the same drugs, all the same things that are happening on one side of our planet are happening on the other. And I may be an outcast in many people's eyes, but I can be a good one. Amen. I may be a Samaritan to many, but I can be a good Samaritan. Would you stand with me today? I hope I was able to keep that message fairly concise for you. And I hope that you were encouraged today.